Mr. Speaker of the Senate, Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister, Honourable Members of the Senate, Members of the House of Commons. J'aimerais tout d'abord... May I first thank you for according me the great privilege and distinction of being invited to address you for a second time. There's a lot to be said for longevity. May I also take this occasion to thank you and the Canadian people for the outstanding hospitality which you have shown to me and to your many visitors from abroad during the past 12 months. It has been indeed an extraordinary year in which world leaders, sportsmen, businessmen and many others have flocked to Canada. The Francophone Summit, the Commonwealth Heads of Government Meeting, the Economic Summit and the Winter Olympics. Mr. Speaker, the British team may not have returned with any gold medals, but I think we can claim to have been represented by the most famous competitor. <laughs> this is a tribute to Canada's success and to the high regard in which your country is held worldwide and most especially within the Commonwealth. A Canadian Prime Minister at the turn of the century predicted that the 20th century will be the century of Canada. The last 12 months have certainly shown his prophecy to be true. And I should like to pay a particular tribute to the skillful and creative chairmanship of those meetings by your Prime Minister, Brown Mulroney, most recently at the highly successful Economic Summit. <laughs> Few have the privilege of feeling that they've moved the world's fortunes a step forward. He has done so and deserves our thanks and congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our two countries are metaphorically and often literally members of the same family. Like a family, we have experiences in common that go back to our beginnings. A Canadian road at Balaclava in the charge of the Light Brigade. Canadian boatmen ferried British soldiers down the Nile in the attempt to rescue General Gordon at Khartoum a century ago. It was an engineer from Quebec, Sir Percy Girouard, who built the railway that was so valuable in opening up the Sudan. And above all, we remember together our war dead by wearing poppies every November because a Canadian soldier Major John McRae wrote the poem in Flanders Fields in the early morning of the 3rd of May, 1915, while the first battle of Ypres was raging. 43 years after VE Day, we honor the valor and sacrifice of Canadian fighting men in two world wars. That is something which we in Britain will never forget, a debt that can never be repaid. So too is the enormously generous help which you gave Britain in the post-war years. Four Canadian Prime Ministers, including Sir John Macdonald, were born in Britain, and the only British Prime Minister born overseas came from New Brunswick. We're delighted that today Canada's involvement in our national life is as strong as ever. There are no less than 160 Canadian firms active in the United Kingdom with nine banks and 13 security houses. <coughs> Individual Canadians, Paul Reichman, Conrad Black, Graham Day, are making a great contribution. 
And most exciting of all is the major Canadian investment in Canary Wharf, the remarkable architectural and commercial renaissance of London's docklands. Last month, I opened the construction phase myself by sinking the first concrete pile. <laughs> With a little help from a pile driver. <laughs> when it is complete, it will be the largest commercial development in Europe. We welcome the confidence and the commitment on the part of Canadian enterprise which it represents. Mr. Speaker, one of the advantages of being among family is that we can compare ailments. Some years ago, we in Britain invented a disease. Its symptoms were a combination of stagnation, inflation, financial problems, labor troubles, and loss of confidence. They called it British disease. A Canadian commentator, Goldwyn Smith, provided an excellent clinical definition of the malady nearly a hundred years ago. He spoke of countries that were rich by nature and poor by policy. Today, many of us in the developed world realize that in varying degrees, we have quite needlessly been poor by policy. But we've come a long way since the days when people thought that you could spend and borrow your way to prosperity, that you needed a budget deficit and a bit of inflation to get economic growth. Now it is understood that the government's role is to keep downward pressure on inflation and to create a sound financial and legal framework in which enterprise can flourish. Yeah. <laughs> that it is not governments which create wealth, but people, provided we have policies which encourage them to do it. We've also got away from the debilitating concept of the all-powerful state, which takes too much from you to do too much for you. Constantly, <laughs> constantly substituting the politician's view of what the people should have for the people's own view of what they want. <laughs> We've had our own perestroika. And as a result, the economy has been growing steadily for seven years, soon to be eight. There are more resources available for the community's needs, and we have a budget surplus with which to repay debt. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you can never do that except by first restoring the spirit of the people. The great economists of the past knew this. Adam Smith was not a professor of economics. He was a professor of moral philosophy. He understood how to work with the grain of human nature. He knew the heights which it could reach, which is why his policies for creating the wealth of nations will endure throughout the years. And today you can feel the pride and confidence, both in Britain and in Canada, both our countries have learned that lesson. As a result, we have achieved remarkable economic success, and today we jostle for the top place in the OECD's growth stakes. Among the economic summit seven countries, sound money, lower taxes, and freedom for enterprise are now common form. It wasn't always so. But every year since the second cycle of summit started in 1982, the heads of government have committed themselves to those policies as the best basis for stable and long-term growth. We've put behind us the financial irresponsibility which made the 1970s a decade of missed opportunity. 
I don't believe that the world could have withstood the shock of last autumn's fall in stock prices so well if our policies had not been built on sure foundations. We have established a new orthodoxy. But low inflation and prudent financial policies need to be supported by open markets and flourishing world trade. Here too, the Toronto summit took important steps forward. We committed ourselves to the success of the GATT roundtable negotiations and encouraged measures to free up world trade. Mr. Speaker, by 1992, every firm in Europe, whether engaged in manufacturing or in services, will have a single market of 320 million people. What a dramatic development that's going to be. To add to it, the Channel Tunnel will give Britain, for the first time in our history, a land border with Europe. There will be new opportunities of every kind, not just for member countries of the European community themselves, but for those countries which trade with the community. And let me reassure you, it is not Britain's intention when removing barriers within Europe to see them raised against our other trading partners outside Europe. But Canada and the United States are pointing the way with the Canada-United States Free Trade Agreement, which the Economic Summit warmly endorsed. that it may be a controversial matter in this chamber. <laughs> and I will only say that I don't underestimate Canada's courage in taking this step in partnership with its giant neighbour. But on the basis of Britain's experience of joining the European community, you need have no fear that Canada's national personality will be in any way diminished. <laughs> Fifteen years of European community membership have left our people no less British and no less proud of their history and independence. <laughs> Moreover, protectionism is not a life belt which keeps an economy afloat. It is a millstone that drags you down and penalizes consumers and workforce alike. the inefficient and soon that is all you have. You lose the competitive edge to export abroad and keep prices down at home. There's another major world problem which we committed ourselves to deal with at the summit. Agriculture will have to bring supply and demand more into balance and until we do that farmers won't feel secure in their future. But look at the situation now. Countries compete with each other to give bigger and bigger subsidies. Farmers in Japan are being paid eight times the world price for rice. In the United States in 1986, one single state received more loans and other aid from Washington than all the nations in Africa got from the World Bank. In Europe, the subsidy per cow is greater than the personal income of half the world's people. And even Canada is not a model of absolute virtue. <laughs> so may I take this opportunity to express my sympathy for the plight of your farmers who are suffering so badly from drought. Abba Eben once said, History teaches us that men and nations behave wisely 
once they have exhausted all other alternatives. <coughs> well, with agriculture, we have exhausted all other alternatives. In Europe, we've made a start in cutting back surpluses and reducing stockpiles, in some cases with dramatic results. At Toronto, we all recognized that setting realistic goals for reducing subsidies on a fair basis in all our countries offered a way forward. A way forward which will offer a surer future for our farmers, a better deal for our consumers, and hope for the third world countries whose markets are unfairly saturated by the sale of our subsidized surpluses. Mr. Speaker, here in this chamber, we are all privileged to be active in government and politics at a time of unprecedented hope and opportunity in relations between East and West. President Reagan's recent summit meeting in Moscow with Mr. Gorbachev was an historic success. A new chapter in East-West relations has been opened. We owe that to President Reagan because of his firmness the way he has stuck resolutely to his convictions and beliefs. We owe it also to Mr. Gorbachev, who with a rare sight has seen that communism has not been able to deliver the standard of living, of social services, of technological advance, which its originators promised. And he's had the vision and resolve to embark on a course which by mobilizing greater personal responsibility and initiative will bring greater benefits. It's not going to be an easy path for the Soviet Union and its allies in Eastern Europe. Those who engage in great endeavors never find the going easy, but it is in our interests as well as those of the Soviet people that he reach his goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every enlargement of liberty serves the interests of all mankind. The foundations of this new hope in East-West relations were not laid in recent months, they were built up over the last four decades by the resolve of the governments and peoples at the heart of the Western world, the United States, Britain and Canada, preeminent among them, to defend liberty, justice and democracy, however heavy the burden and whatever the price. Now we are beginning to reap the rewards. The agreement to reduce intermediate nuclear forces and the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan. Who would have thought, Mr. Speaker, five years ago, when I last spoke in this chamber, that either of these things would come about? The more hopeful signs from the Soviet Union are bound to raise questions in people's minds. Can't we take a chance? Do we need to go on with the present level of spending on defense? Hasn't the time come when we can relax our guard? Mr. Speaker, nothing could be more dangerous. <laughs> First, we can't base our defense on hope, only on reality. And the reality is that the Soviet military spending continues to grow and their weapon systems are being constantly modernized and updated in every field. Their forces are far in excess of what they need for defensive purposes alone. And second, we don't know whether Mr. Gorbachev will succeed in his new policies. Old ways die hard. And there is still little evidence that the Soviet Union's long-term foreign policy objectives have changed. We can hope for the best, but a prudent defense must plan for the worst case. And third, modern weapons are so sophisticated that they take many years to plan and produce. A mistake or miscalculation now could leave us vulnerable and unprotected at a time when our potential enemies are continuing to increase their military strengths. And fourth, we are in a position to welcome the changes taking place in the Soviet Union because we know that whatever happens, our defense is sure. For nearly 40 years, that remarkable organization, NATO, has kept the peace. It's done so 
because everyone knew that an attack on one member would be an attack on all and we would respond accordingly. And because we've had an effective mix of nuclear and conventional weapons and kept them up to date. And I pay particular tribute to Canada's contribution to NATO's strength and success by the way in which she welcomes our troops to train and exercise, by the resolute manner in which she agreed to test cruise missiles over her territory, a demonstration of resolve which was crucial at that time, and by her intention to modernize her navy by acquiring nuclear-powered submarines, we very much hope from Britain. <laughs> They're quite the best in Canada, Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, wars aren't caused by strength or by armaments. They happen when nations are weak in the face of others who are both ambitious and strong. Our duty is to preserve NATO's strength by constantly updating our weapons, both nuclear and conventional, by maintaining, as you do, highly professional and trained armed forces, and by demonstrating our united resolve. Peace with freedom and justice is the most precious thing we have, both for our generation and for our children. That is the trust they place in us, and we mustn't fail them. Mr. Speaker, we must always remember what lies at the very root of the differences between the Soviet system and the free world. It is a fundamentally different view of the role of the individual and his rights in society. History hasn't equipped the Russian people with the capacity to escape easily from the incubus of state socialism. They know nothing of personal liberty have never experienced an independent judiciary, are strangers to tolerance and the checks and balances which operate in a free society. People used to believe that dictatorships had the advantage of being more efficient and better able to act decisively than the democracies. They were wrong. Now they understand that you can't plan and regulate everything and that if you try, you lose the driving force of human nature and its inventiveness and creativity. In modern societies, success depends on openness, on free discussion, and on easy access to information. We in the West could never have experienced the great surge of technological advance without them. Once you try to suppress and restrain them, then not only are you unable to change, you are unable to respond to change. Mr. Speaker, the example of what freedom has achieved in the open societies of the West is a powerful incentive to the closed societies of the Eastern Bloc to extend it to their people and to accept restraints on the power of those who rule. But the case for freedom can never be merely a material one. It is a moral crusade. The communist societies still see human rights as something given by the state, which can be taken away by the state. For us, they are something so fundamental that they can't be given or taken away by any government or human agency. <laughs> have us believe that speaking out about human rights runs counter to the aim of better relations, play into the hands of the enemies of freedom. As President Reagan recently said in an inspired speech in London's Guildhall immediately after the Moscow summit, when free people cease telling the truth about and to their adversaries, they cease telling the truth to themselves. In matters of state, Unless the truth be spoken, it ceases to exist. Mr. Speaker, freedom is on the offensive as never before. Amen. A peaceful offensive, pursued by example and by persuasion, 
Its triumph is our highest ambition. In taking his leave of you in 1952, Winston Churchill didn't say goodbye. Rather, he said, Au revoir, mes amis canadiens. Let un avenir splendide. Farewell, my Canadian friends. A marvelous future awaits you. A splendid future that awaits Canada, one filled with opportunity and pride. I know that Britain and Canada will walk that road together, unswerving in our purpose, strong in our joint defense, and firm in our abiding friendship. Yeah.